Welcome back. Ian GM3 SEK is one of the most respected technical authors in the UK amateur radio scene and he's teamed up with Peter G4 DSE and a number of other experts to provide us through the RSGB with much needed advice on EMF exposure calculations. The latest advice including VHF beams has just been published on the RSGB website. Well, following a joint request from the UK Microwave Group and the BATC, Ian and Peter will now show us their findings for microwave operation, including QO100. Now, as before, you can enter questions and comments on Zoom or the BATC streamer during the talk, and I'll relay these to both Ian and Peter after the presentation. Please include your first name and your call sign if you have one at the beginning of your message. But first, Ian brings us up to date on EMF for microwaves and the QO100. Welcome, Ian. Thank you, David. Uh, and a very good afternoon from southwest Scotland in the shack, as you see. Uh, the first thing I have to say is that the brains of this outfit is Peter G4 DSE. Um, COVID being what it is, we, Peter and I have never actually met. Uh, but um, I can tell you this much. Uh, in amateur radio, he's he's been mainly an HF contester, uh, first with the Bangor University Club, but, and then with the Bracknell Club, and of course in his own right. Uh, after Bangor, he started work with Raycon, but then he he soon joined a small startup company. You know the kind where your employee number is a single digit. Uh, However, that company was called Vodafone, and 34 years later, he retired as a chief engineer uh, after leading several major programs that shaped today's mobile telecoms industry. So in other words, he's, he's an industry notable, this Peter. Um, most notable for us was that Peter's been responsible for the development of the Vodafone Group's policies for RF health and safety, uh, which obviously includes microwaves. And, um, and even through retirement, that has not left him. Um, in fact, it's led him into international standards work. He's a fellow of the IET, senior member of the IEEE, and let's just say very well connected. In other words, we're lucky to have him on our side of the table. Uh, this is an RSGB initiative, but it's just been done by the people who've uh, volunteered and, and find themselves at, at, the, at the sharp end. Um, but further to what David was just saying, you might know of me as a technical author, but um, during all that time, I've been a chartered professional in radiation protection, uh, initially with the National Radiological Protection Board. Uh, so this interaction between RSGB and the regulator is not my first rodeo. Uh, I've been working mainly on the nuclear side, but also obviously taking an interest in RF health and safety. So, as I say, Peter is the brains of the outfit. Um, when, whenever I say we, you can take it that the idea was Peter's and my part has been to present it that's in a way that's understandable to the rest of us. Um, that's, I think, has been my main contribution. So let's get started. Rather than swapping over, uh, I'm going to do the, this scripted presentation, and then Peter will take over as the lead for the Q&A. So here we go. Yeah. There's a new license requirement, uh, which is now in all our licenses, should you care to download a copy, which in short says, make sure that your transmissions don't breach the ignorant limits for EMF exposures of the general public. Now that's a lot of jargon. ICNERP, International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, uh, EMF, Electromagnetic Fields, General public may not be quite what you think it is. Um, it excludes workers, and it also happens to exclude radio amateurs. Ofcom has no opinion on we, what we should do to protect ourselves. All that background detail you'll find at rsgb.org forward slash EMF. Uh, 
Some of it is in RADCOM, but due to the volume of material, uh, the primary source now is on the web. So look there, bookmark it, and, and check in there for updates. But the other thing that Ofcom said is we now have to make assessments to ensure that this license condition is met. And that's where the fun begins, isn't it? So what we have to do, in effect, is to define something called an EMF exclusion zone, which is a zone within which the exposure limits could be exceeded. It doesn't mean they necessarily will be. And then have some control over the exclusion zone so that if somebody actually is present in that zone, then you don't transmit in the first place. If somebody wanders into it, then stop transmitting, and it's fine if you can do it promptly for reasons that will become apparent. And the third requirement then is to record your assessment. Fortunately, we're not in Germany where we have to file it with anybody. We simply have to have it available for inspection uh, should somebody come around, which is very much like used to be the case with the RMT radio log when log keeping was compulsory. So to achieve compliance, you need to know the boundaries of the EMF exclusion zone. Preferably make that inaccessible. Uh, this is what HSE, for example, would call engineered safeguards. Uh, the most obvious way being to mount the antenna as high as possible and out of reach. Now, now this obviously isn't feasible for all kinds of microwave operations. So uh, we've got to cover the alternative as well which is always to know if people are inside the exclusion zone and then act accordingly. And this active supervision, it's a, it's a big plus for amateur radio. It's something that most commercial operators don't have anymore because uh, people don't work at the transmitting stations. So, we need to exploit that and take maximum advantage of it. I should also add that no action is needed regarding persons outside of the exclusion zone, because that follows from the basic definition of what an exclusion zone actually is. Right, there is also another way to comply while we're on the subject of basic principles. And that is if your equipment never exceeds 10 watts EIRP averaged over six minutes. Uh, the bit in the brackets essentially says, and don't try to gain the system by using, game the system by using pulse, forget that. 10 watts EIRP over six minutes is absolutely fine for people with a five watt handheld and a rubber dock. Uh, they can note this down on a bit of paper or wherever and say, uh, my EIRP is less than 10 watts. Uh, I don't require, I'm not required to do any further assessment. But let's have a look at this averaged over six minutes as well, because th this is an unfamiliar bit. So uh, there's, there's reason to take a diversion and have a look at it. The important thing is you're allowed to do it and you always should, because otherwise you're being excessively conservative in your tying your own hands. For example, if you only transmit 50% of the time over any rolling six minute period, then your average power is only a half of your PEP. And I think that's a realistic default for most people. Most people are rarely going to find themselves transmitting over 50% of the time without any uh, compensating received periods. The other factor that can affect your average is related to the 
transmission mode. So SSB, the, the average power could be anywhere between 20 and 50% of your PEP, depending on how much compression you use. For CW, uh, the average key down time is about 40%, but for full carrier modes, including numbers of digital modes, uh, it's likely to be 100%, so you can't claim anything further beyond that. But do average your power. Having said which, all the power levels that we're going to quote here have already been averaged. I'll show one or two examples in passing later about the effects of this. Oh, back to the main track. 10 watts EIRP, where did that come from? It didn't come from ITNERP, it came from Ofcom. And Ofcom are very fond of EIRP, it has to be said. Um, they possibly overlooked the fact that EIRP can also mean very low RF power multiplied by very high antenna gain. For example, 10 watts ERP could be 100 milliwatts and 20 dBi, which is very much an entry level uh, antenna gain uh, on microwaves, on, unless you're using something like a horn for a short distance communication. Could be 10 watts and 30 dBi, decent sized dish. What 10 milliwatts, I beg your pardon, and 30 dBi, or one milliwatt and 40 dBi, you, you get the picture, even though 40 dBi is becoming difficult. Um, there hasn't been sufficient consideration in the, the blanket Ofcom exemption uh, for the case where there's tiny power and appreciable antenna gain. So we've looked into that. I'll come back very near the end to show you what the results have been so far. And um, it's, it's not too much of a spoiler to say it's looking like good news. So let's leave the basic principles behind and try and see how these play out at microwave wavelengths. The first thing to notice is that microwave wavelengths are very much shorter than at HF. Uh, it sounds obvious until you hear people talking in a way that has completely overlooked that important difference. Um, even, on, even on microwaves going up to 246 gigahertz as a convenient stopping place. That's a ratio of 200 to one in wavelengths. The ratio from top band to 246 gigahertz is 100,000 to one, that order of magnitude. And you should expect that to make a few differences. The first is the field changes very much more rapidly over a short distance. If you're, if you're standing underneath the end of an 80 meter dipole, you're totally bathed in the field and you're gonna to have to walk meters, tens of meters to, uh, to get to somewhere where the field is significantly less. On microwaves, you might even just have to move your hand uh, or certainly take take one step back and you can say, I'm completely out of the high RF area. So with narrower main beams, it makes it much easier to envisage, to see it in your mind's eye and to avoid it, or alternatively to exclude people from stepping into it. So some things are easier. These sharp boundaries mean that the exclusion zone uh, you're pretty much either in or out in practical situations. Also not HF is that you guys know what you're doing. Uh, microwaves are not entry level and it needs a different kind of support 
therefore, from what we're giving to uh, newly licensed foundation licensees who, um, who never signed up for anything of this technical complexity. So, so then we have to, we have to give 100% support uh, from yourselves. We're understanding, we're, we're, we're presuming that uh, you, you have an understanding of the, the technical RF side and also that you're prepared to give us some feedback and help us to improve the, the advice that we're putting in place. Because there will be new people coming in who don't know the stuff that, uh, that you guys already know and take for granted. And we're very glad to, to have the, the formal cooperation of both BATC and the UK Microwave Group in rolling this stuff out. But some microwaving MF advice can be very simple, very practical. Because you, you do know what you're doing, uh, don't do anything that you already know you shouldn't be doing. It, it's, it's really as simple as that. For example, things you already know you shouldn't be doing and don't. Don't look into the waveguide. We, we all know that. And, um, and we all know where it came from in the beginning uh, with, um, with some very unpleasant uh, experiences with, with high power radars during wartime. Um, but we know now why we don't look in the waveguide to avoid localized high concentrations of electromagnetic field. Broadening that out, don't allow any body part your your own body or anybody else's in an area of high EMF while you transmit or don't transmit accordingly. Make make your decisions. Um, you know you know you shouldn't be doing these things. You're not doing them. So the first big chunk of EMF advice is carry on not doing those things, and in doing so you will be delivering a large chunk of practical radiation protection. Uh, people who know what they're doing are actually the, the biggest and most important form of radiation protection. Right, now it gets more technical because there are things that need to be calculated in order to compare with the, the you know, limits, the, the applicable hit ignorant limits, um, which are on human exposure and um, not directly on field strength. So because the, uh, the fields, sorry, excuse me saying EMF all the time, but it, it's considerate um, an industrial disease. Uh, the, the EMF is varying uh, very considerably in, in space. So if you're going to calculate a whole body average, it must be evaluated correctly using several different sampling points. And what Peter's developed here is, um, well, the simplest kind of, of average where, where the, the field is computed at 0.1 meter intervals uh, from the foot to the head of a 1.8 meter um, standard tall standard reference person, and then if you if you take an average that's reasonably representative of um, of the true whole body average that needs to be evaluated. So that's that's the first step, um, and then we've got to. We've got this 1.8 meter tall smear of numbers, uh, which we then have got to attribute the average to some point in space and which one is it? Uh, the question we've chosen to answer is, is it okay for someone to be standing at this point? In other words, the average of all these, this vertical column of, uh, of power densities 
is uh, attributed to the, the level on which the person is standing. We'll, we'll come back to this, but I'll show you an example straight away. Uh, when we're mapping out the, uh, the boundaries of the exclusion zone, we, we move this column of points representing the, the exposed individual closer and closer and closer to the, the beam until it trips the alarm for one of the ignorant limits and then stick a pin in it at the position of the foot and say that's the boundary of the exclusion zone. And then we, Peter's big workstation, do it everywhere else across this, um, this 2D projection. So from the side, it's done like that until an alarm trips. And, um, and so it goes on in slices coming out of the, out of your screen uh, along the beam, which is an enormous number of calculations. But that's what's needed to do it properly. And then it gets worse. Uh, in ICNA 2020, there are new limits for local exposure, uh, which could apply to any two by two centimeter area. Uh, these, these limits are higher for um, whole body average, but it doesn't change the fact that uh, you need to calculate a very dense array of RF film strength points before you can begin to estimate human exposure according to either of those limits. It's very onerous to, to do that, um, which is why we, that is Peter, that is Peter's workstation, are handling those details so that you won't need to. Um, you didn't sign up for this level of detail. So we have to simplify it to, to roll out some advice that is actually capable of being followed. So back to the basic question then, where exactly are the EMF exclusion zones? Uh, all I can do today is just give you a few highlights, but do remember there's a heck of a lot more underneath the waterline and you'll find this in the full technical report, which is going to be published in the next few weeks. That's um, pre-assessed equipment configuration, which is Ofcom speak for um, what we're doing here. It's essentially taking a trusted source um, such as RSGB, which you can quote, and that will satisfy Ofcom. So, oh, okay, let's have a look at fields from dishes then. Uh, parabolic reflectors. Why do we use a parabolic reflector? Uh, it's because of the geometry of the of a parabola that if you uh, if you illuminate a paraboloidal surface um, from the focus, then the length of travel of all of the rays from the focus to the aperture plane is the same across the whole aperture plane. That means ideally uh, there will be uniform phase across that aperture. We we're very keen on the idea of the aperture plane as the place to start because um, everything prior to that depends quite a lot on dish design. But let's let's start with whatever the uh, the kind of of horn and reflector uh, we have, and let's just start at the aperture plane because coming out of there initially is a parallel sided cylinder. Of, uh, of RF energy uh, and it's uh, it's there that uh, 
that our exclusion zone is going to start. Beyond that, we know that ultimately that parallel sided beam will diverge out into, into being the more conical uh, beam radiation pattern that we recognize in the far field, uh, characterized by that angle, which is the beam width. But that, that gives us enough of a basic concept now to start building up the exclusion zone. And the place where we start there is between the dish and the feed. Don't go there. Uh, fields are likely to be extremely high because in the horn itself, uh, the energy is concentrated into a very small aperture. Uh, and, and quite frankly, there is no need to place yourself uh, between the horn and the, uh, and the dish. Just don't go there. What happens then is that even though the, the RF energy starts out emerging from a flat planar aperture, uh, the interference between rays that travel from different parts of the aperture uh, to reach a certain point um, creates a very complex uh, interference pattern in this near field cylinder. Uh, I'll show you in, in a few moments just how complex it does get. Uh, so as far as the exclusion zone is concerned, we're simply saying this is the home to high localized EMFs. Again, don't go there, nor anywhere in between. There's a very good reason to, um, to put this no entry sign close to the end of this cylindrical zone because it's there almost always that the field strength somewhere is going to be the highest of all. But then beyond that, it's almost certain that the exclusion zone will extend into the far field. One of the, uh, one of the greatest advantages, or greatest advances, should I say, in, in microwaves over the past few decades has been that at least on the lower bands, we're no longer uh, stuck at having generated a milliwatt and wondering how to, uh, how to get that up to a decent power level. We are now, typically running the kinds of power levels where the exclusion zone very probably extends out into the far field. Uh, you'll see that also in a moment. So that then raises questions, um, which um, let's come back to, let's take a diversion first uh, and have a look exactly what is happening um, in the near field. This is, this is a certain amount of show and tell because it um, it illustrates the power of the software that uh, that Peter has written. Uh, so we're plotting power density watts per square meter is always given the symbol S. Uh, we're plotting power density against distance forward from the aperture, and we've got two regions here quite clearly the two very different regions. In the near field region, the strongly varying fields, only even distribution within the beam, localized areas of high, very high power density. Meanwhile, on the other side, it eventually settles down at greater distances to the far field, to become the far field where power density varies as one over distance squared, and there's a much more even distribution of energy across the beam. To give you some idea of what these distributions look like, this picture is a plot of the, the power density color shaded at point A looking back towards the dish. And that peak there just represents one small pimple, although if you if you've only plotted along the axis of the dish, you would never know that surrounding that pimple is a ring of energy. What happens at point B, where the, the axial power density goes through a minimum, 
again, you couldn't have predicted. What's happened is that that energy has spread out and has concentrated itself now into a ring. And there's just, there's just a dip in the middle. By the time you get to point C, the last and biggest, almost always, uh, then the beam has actually become quite narrow and it's concentrated in the middle. Uh, and this is beginning to look like way too much information, way too much complexity that we don't need to deal with, which is why we've slapped a no entry sign on it. Again, you don't need to be in there. By the time it gets to the far field, it's something more like what you would expect. The beam has broadened out, mostly because it isn't crowding itself into the middle anymore. Uh, and um, there's more energy in the middle than there is at the edges, but uh, that's what you would expect in, in the far field. But yeah, too much information. Uh, we need to go back to simple formulae, but uh, I th we thought it was worthwhile showing you the, the depth of analysis that actually exists uh, under the waterline of this iceberg. So back on the main road, we're gonna use a separate formula for, for each region. And um, in areas where the near field formula uh, gives you the, the largest result for the power density, that's, that's where we call it the near field. That's why we call it near field. When the far field formula uh, gives you the largest result, then, okay, we're calling that the far field. We're not having anything to do with radiative, reactive, and all the other little labels that people like to stick on there. Uh, it isn't necessary for this purpose at all. So where do we got to? the exclusion zone probably extending into the far field, which then begs a whole new lot of questions. How far does it extend? That's the X direction in the coordinate system that we've adopted. How wide is it? Uh, and that's in the direction in and out of the picture sideways. And how close to ground is it in the case where the antenna is significantly above ground level. So we've got X, Y, and Z clearances or compliance distances that need to be evaluated. Once we've got those, we can then move on to doing some coordinate transformations and tilting the whole thing upwards for satellite and DME while still calculating what are the exposures or what are the issues down at ground level. And Peter's graphics software, which is based on its Wolfram Mathematica, uh, is capable of taking the whole matrix of calculated three-dimensional uh, RF field points, uh, doing the averaging uh, as appropriate over a range of points, and then drawing contour maps of exclusion zones versus RF power. This is fairly computationally intensive in that each pixel of this diagram uh, represents the result of a, of a computation, except around the edges. Uh, The RF power is shown by the color shaded contours. So the exclusion zone for 400 watts, the blue is the biggest of all, as you expect. As you reduce the power, the exclusion zone shrinks backwards towards the dish, towards the aperture plane, and also becomes narrower uh, until eventually at very low power. Uh, the exclusion zone retreats back into, uh, into the cylindrical near field zone. So one thing you notice as, as you look at this is that all these exclusion zones have pretty much the same shape and 
that means it's possible to characterize them by just two dimensions. Uh, I'll do the 400 watt one um, because it, it's easiest to see. Uh, there's, there's less clutter at, at this right hand end of the diagram. But okay, uh, the two dimensions are the, the overall length beyond which uh, no further precautions are necessary for this particular setup and the half width. So the full width is plus and minus 2.7 meters. Scale that down to 20 watts and you get a length of only 10 meters now. Uh, and the width is plus and minus one meter. So, right, we've now got a, a setup where um, instead of having to draw uh, countless numbers of megapixel diagrams, one for each variation in the, the dish size, the power level, etc. Uh, we just need one diagram for, for general reference purposes, and then the rest we can do by tables of numbers. Big sigh of relief, because that means that we can roll this stuff out as a spreadsheet. And the example here uh, is going to be fairly familiar to you, or at least the frequency will be almost familiar. Um, for 13 centimeters, we use 2350, the middle of the band, uh, because it's adequately representative of both the top end and the bottom end. Uh, these figures on the diagram below uh, are for a 1.2 meter dish then at 2350. The reason we can't give you a smaller diameter at the moment is that at this wavelength, 1.2 meters is about the smallest standard size that, um, that can be trusted to, uh, to behave itself in, uh, in a manner that's consistent with the, the old classical optics from which all of this has, has been derived. So, um, Below about 10 wavelengths, maybe we can squeeze it down to eight. Uh, we're not quite sure about the results yet. So smaller dishes uh, are a priority uh, to be able to, to verify that the method is working okay. So 1.2 meter dish, 20 watts. Um, to our great relief, the uh, the spreadsheet table shows the same two numbers as, uh, as on the diagram and at 400 watts, the same is true. So these figures are, are for the, the X compliance distance downrange, the Y compliance distance parallel to the ground. What about Z? This one is a little bit tricky. Uh, it's one of those things where first glance looks straightforward. Uh, second glance, you scratch your head. When you, if you look at it for long enough, you realize that you're right in the first place. Uh, so the easiest way to deal with the Z compliance is actually to just look at the table. Um, however, well, here is the uh, here is the diagram, and here is what these figures mean. Uh, we're looking from the side now, so Z is now literally up and down, X is forwards as before. The X compliance distance is obviously the same as it was in the previous uh, rotated projection. Uh, what that figure of three point eight means at four hundred is that it's okay for somebody to be standing with their foot position at or below a level 3.8 meters below the bottom edge, sorry, below the center of the dish, 3.8 meters below the center of the dish. 
anybody standing at a lower level than that will also be compliant. As soon as somebody's foot level enters that, then it's non-compliant. 20 watts is, is the same, uh, except the, the relevant figure there is 2.4 meters. Now, if you think about what 2.4 meters below the, the center of a 1.2 meter diameter dish means, it means that a 1.8 meter tall person uh, could actually be standing with the head, uh, top of the head level with the bottom of the dish. And um, okay, we don't we don't feel totally confident in that. That's that's obviously too marginal. What we've done on all the other bands, and are going to continue to do, is to say if you're raising your antenna above ground level, uh, then if it, if it's an HF antenna tied to a fence or um, or something on the top of a, a 60 foot tower, um, just make sure at least that no part of the antenna can be touched from ground level. So we, we've set an arbitrary minimum of 2.4 meters from ground level. Uh, to the lowest part of the antenna. And in this case, it would be to the lowest edge of the dish. Uh, and that, that then starts to, to look a bit more sensible. But as, as I said, this, this said compliance, everybody finds it, it takes some getting your head around. Everybody also finds that they can't think of a better way to do it. Now then, while we're here, let's have a look at what the Ofcom calculator has to say. Um, the, the data that it needs uh, are the, the forward gain of the dish, which is uh, just short of 28 dBi, and the RF power, nothing more. And what you get from that is 15.9 meters clearance required in every direction. Um, because the Ofcom calculator doesn't recognize that if you have gain in one direction, then you must be, that is because you have removed uh, RF energy from all other directions. So actually comparing the numbers, the, the 10.1 meters in this calculation and the 15.9 from the Ofcom are, they're actually consistent because the Ofcom includes uh, a factor of 1.6 allowance for ground reflection, uh, whether you need it or not, uh, whether it makes sense or not, uh, in every direction, the Ofcom calculator uh, multiplies its results by a factor of 1.6. So if you, did, if you take that out of there and compare that with ours, which doesn't include ground reflection, those two, those two figures are, are actually very consistent. 15.9 divided by 1.6 is actually 9.9. .9. Those figures are consistent because in both cases, by the time we get to the compliance distance, we're doing a far field calculation. But the Y and the Z compliance distances are unhelpful. Right, so that's, um, that's about all I was planning to say about the, the calculations that, that have been done by by detailed uh, bottom-up calculation of field strengths, um, starting from the most basic uh, ground assumptions. But I did promise something about the low power exemption. And what we're looking for here is 
a power level below which compliance can be guaranteed by proving that it's physically impossible to exceed any of the basic restrictions using that available level of power. Now, any guarantee obviously has terms and conditions, and um, this is no exception. But what we're looking for is the widest achievable, sensibly achievable range of applicability. We don't want to make the same mistake as the Ofcom calculator of, of trying to um, use the same methodology uh, across a range of wavelengths of 100,000 to one, uh, because uh, that's, that's only going to end in tears. So at least we're going to try to have a few numbers, each of which can be used across a decent sized chunk of the microwave spectrum. Now, the only way to do this, to prove physical impossibility, is to step right outside the business of of calculating uh, power densities and, um, and look for three inputs here from three different sources. One is ICNIP itself, because ICNIP restrictions are fundamentally about avoiding harmful temperature rise of body tissue. Uh, in other words, um, the amount of energy that, it, that they're allowing to be deposited is meant to be well within the capabilities of the, of the human body to, to dissipate it internally. Uh, the governing units here are watts per kilogram, joules of energy deposited in, in unit time uh, into unit mass of tissue. For whole body exposure, that's obviously the total power absorbed in the total body mass. For local exposure, it's the power absorbed in a defined small mass or by implication, small area. Next place to look is what body mass should we assume? And this comes from IEC standard 62232, which is the governing standard for this whole topic area for um, for communication-based stations. That's, that's the short version of a very long title. Um, and it does include guidance on what body weight to use if you're going to do this kind of assessment. Peter knew exactly where to look for it because he led the development of issue one of 62232. And the third input is the stuff we're much more familiar with, the RF engineering side, the relationships between dish size, efficiency, peak power density, and so on. So putting those together, and we were still working on this um, earlier this, uh, this past week. So we'll just give you one example because the others are going to require a bit more thought. Uh, they're doable, but will need more thought. Average powers up to one watt can be guaranteed compliant on any band up to 10 gigahertz, provided that the energy is distributed over at least 0.5 meters diameter, That's over a circle of at least 0.5 meters diameter. Um, so, yeah, it's. Uh, when we've got this tied down, you'll be able to take this to the bank or rather take it to Ofcom uh, to say, this is my compliance for, for using low power until I increase the power. Uh, and as I said, every guarantee has terms and conditions. So you have to be careful not to use this outside of its area of applicability. So for ab above 10 gigs, we're working on it and um, 
there will be values produced there. More in the forthcoming report, definitely, including the higher bounds. And then we come to not the shortest part of this talk, which is the to-do list. Uh, we're, we're delighted now that we can be working with the microwave group and BATC. That's Dave, GHGKQ for UK microwave group and Noel, GHGTZ representing BATC. Although each of them is a member of both organizations, so that, that's fine. And things that we're looking for feedback on are practical values for tables and spreadsheets to cut down the range of, um, of computations that, that need to be done. We're, we're already fairly clear that five meter dishes will not be needed for 122 gigahertz. Although we could, we could, uh, but we'd rather not. Let's just restrict ourselves to what's practical. The issue of smaller dishes I've already identified, less than eight wavelengths diameter is going to need some verification, but it's important for the lower bounds. Uh, not because they, such small dishes make particularly good antennas, but because they exist and therefore there needs to be some help with the, uh, with the compliance. Um, we haven't looked yet at offset feeds, but um, since our calculations really begin at the aperture plane, um, we can regard that as a mod rather than something that needs to be restarted from scratch. Um, we've got ideas about spillover. We, over the, past the edge of the dish, we, we've been looking at that all the time. We've been looking at the other stuff. Um, it just hasn't been written up yet. Ground reflection comes into this. Um, this is already on the agenda uh, because it's, uh, it affects the, the VHF and UHF bands, which we had already covered in issue one of the PAC-2 report. Tilt angles for satellite and EME. Uh, likewise, um, once we've once we've got the main problem tied down, then it's just going to be a matter of uh, of transposing and rotating coordinates, which is not going to be tri trivial programming, uh, but it's it's not a big jumping concept. Uh, 13 centimeter Yagis, uh, the PAC-2 report for VHF and UHF already covers 23 centimeter Yagis, and we, we have the potential to, to do Yagis up to at least 100 elements. The 13 centimeter Yagi, because of the shorter wavelength, is going to need a lot more uh, data points, so that's going to be a massive computation, which Peter would like to do only once because he's paying the electricity bill for this, uh, which is not trivial. And then we publish the PAC-3 report covering all of this and inform Ofcom that it's there and that at that point you can begin quoting it. Further down the line, we need to look at the role of measurements. I'll, I'll skip over that at the moment, except to notice that uh, it's more practical at, at microwaves and UK microwave group has in fact done at least half of the, the job of getting equipment together already. And then help going both ways. We help you guys with rollout. You help us with the feedback because all of these are a process that they're a journey uh, we, we, we're not going to just go away after doing issue one. Uh, it, this is going to be going on until it's basically a commonplace part of, of amateur radio, something to be aware of, but not scared of. So thanks very much indeed. This has been a very short version. Um, I'd remind you that um, of the iceberg. Uh, so 
hopefully anything that I've ex excluded or, or left out has been done deliberately and I could potentially tell you why. Um, so the advice for now, keep avoiding the exclusion zones that we already know about, learn about the actual boundaries of the exclusion zones and apply them. And just recognize that this is new stuff. It, we've all got more, more to learn about this. And um, uh, Peter and I, uh, nobody better, Peter and I and John Rogers, M0JEV, uh, I think have, uh, have experienced this more than anybody else. Uh, okay, we're, we're still alive. So please give us your experience and feedback. So that's it. Thank you. And I'll hand back to, to David to rearrange the screen and, uh, uh, and then uh, help us to run the discussion. Thank you once again. Thank you, Ian. It's a big subject, isn't it? And it's uh, going to affect all of us who transmit over, I think it's 110 megs from the 18th of November, I believe. So just, just over a month's time. Well, uh, joining us now as well is Peter. And we're going to, uh, let's see them both now, if we can, I think. There we are. Well, welcome to you, Peter. I know you've had a few internet issues, so we just thought we'd tell everybody now that so that if you do disappear or freeze or something, in the middle of this, then it's just down to a few local network problems that you've got at the moment. But thank you for joining us as well, Peter. Thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's an honor to be involved in this. And I must congratulate uh, my colleague Ian on, on an excellent presentation, far better than I could have given. Well, he, as he said, I think, uh, you know, he did the presentation, but a, a lot of the work, the hard work that's gone into the calculations has all come from you. So I think it's a great team that you've got there. Now, it's a great opportunity now for you watching at home, whether you're on BATC streamer or you're on Zoom, to ask those questions. You must have lots. I guess it's not going to be practical for them just to say, well, I've got this dish, will I be OK? But maybe if you've got some specific questions about the ICNUT regulations and how it affects you, and maybe some experiences as well. Remember that Ian has said that they really do need your help with this. They're volunteers, um, and uh, as, as uh, indeed many of us are, and you know, we, it needs to be a collaborative effort. So if you've got any suggestions, proposals, experiences that you've got had so far to share, as well as questions, please start ans asking them now. We've allowed extra time for the questions on this session. So there's quite a bit of time, but we would like you to start getting those questions in. Now we've had one already, and I'll read that first. Um, Hi, this is from Mike, sorry, G0MJW. Hi Ian, ironically, if I transmit my 100 milliwatts with the feed into uh, with 10 dB gain, I don't exceed the limit if I stand in front of it at the place the dish would be. I only need to do the calculation once I add the dish. Non-physical, but regulations rarely are. On the dish access, I have to apply the 41 times far field transition level. And he's put under there as well with a typical QO100 setup, 1.2 meters, 50 watts. The results are fortunately good. So that's from Mike. Any thoughts about that, either of you? I think um, one of you, we had the um, presentation at, right at the end where Ian was going through some of the basic calculations. Um, and very simply, if you've got 10 milliwatts of power, or you've got 10 milliwatts of power, um, and there's only so much damage you can't do with 10 milliwatts. And it's just a case of expressing that in ICNERP sensible ways and then move on. You don't need to do anything else. Okay, anything to add to that, Ian? Um, except to uh, to say good afternoon to, to my old friend Mike, and I knew we could rely on you for, for a question. <laughs> Wait, thanks. Uh, well, we've got another question now uh, from um, Russ, G4SAQ. Please clarify where the Z-axis runs from on the slide. It did not appear to start from the centre of the beam. Thanks. The z-axis um, does start from the centre of the beam. What you're seeing there is where the uh, where your foot would go. So really, we're actually demonstrating where the exclusion zone is. Um, this is one of the um, complicating factors. Um, if you remember, we had this picture of a person where we had the red star at the bottom and a whole range of samples going all the way up the whole body. Now that means that the 
position that is expressed for the person is not the head, it is not the tummy, it is the foot. And so therefore, by definition, everything seems to be moved down by around about 0.9 of a metre or, or half the height of the body. So it's, it's, it's confusion on interpretation. And as Ian, I think, tried very hard to explain, if there's no person there, then um, you've got to have some way of working out whether a location where your foot might be is going to be compliant or not compliant. And so therefore, that is why we've chosen this. Um, if, if the, beam, if the um, exclusion zone hits the ground, then basically that means the ground is non-compliant. If the exclusion zone is above the ground, then you are compliant when you're standing on the ground. And that is why everything, as I say, seems to be moved down. When you do the top-down view, you don't have that distortion. I don't know yeah. if that's clear, but I think, you know, maybe, maybe Ian, you can have another go at explaining it. Well, yeah, I think the, uh, the, the difficulty is when you when you look at a map of the exclusion zone, um, it, it looks so similar to um, a map of field strength that uh, it, can, it can trap you into, into thinking that you are looking at the field strength, whereas uh, the exclusion zone can be somewhere else because of this height of the body effect. Um, you know, one thing I should have mentioned is uh, if you're going to mount a dish on a mast, then do try to mount it at a height where the exclusion zone uh, is entirely above ground level so that people can walk freely anywhere uh, without having to, without you having to, to track what's happening. Uh, that's, that's a big win. In, in operational terms, and uh, we've we've emphasised that uh, on the VHF report. But yeah, uh, yeah, the the main thing is that a map of exclusion zone is not the same as a map of field strength. Yeah, so if I just come back on that, and while we've got this picture on here, imagine that you have got a. Um, I'm now looking towards the the left hand side of the. Um, of the diagram there. Just, just could, sorry, Peter, could you just bear with us? Right, we're just going to show that picture. Sorry that everybody at home at that moment couldn't see that, but okay, they, so they can now. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, good. Sorry. Um, if you look at this picture and we look at the, the you know, left-hand end of the torpedo where the, uh, where the dish is. Now, imagine that we've, you know, the ed imagine you've got somebody standing somewhere and we're saying that the way they're standing is at the, um, at the zero level. Now, what that means is their foot is on the axis of the um, of the dish transmission. So therefore, bottom half of their body only is within the cone. Now imagine that they are standing 0.9 meters below the dish. Now, the whole of the body is going to be within the cone. So therefore, that is why you have this apparent translation of the exclusion zone downwards. It is the interpretation of where the foot level is. I don't know if that helps. All right, I think, uh, well, hopefully that's uh, helped. We're just gonna go back to the full screen now. Um, and so let's read you another couple of questions. Um, actually, I think it's on a similar vein, so I'm gonna read this to you. This is from Ben G4BXD and says, why are Y and Z different on a basically tubular beam? It's exactly the same reason, because um, when you are below, uh, you have got the height of the body involved. And when you're on, uh, when you're sideways, um, you've got a peak um, as you, I don't, I don't know if people can see the picture here. Yeah, if you hold it in front of you, Peter, actually, because otherwise your virtual background will take over. So oh, okay, yeah, that's right. fine. So, 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 so imagine, imagine uh, this is the, um, the cylinder and you're, yeah, yeah, you're, you're looking directly at it. If you have got something coming from the side, then basically you're always going to have a maximum there as the person is, is in that position. If you're coming from the bottom, then essentially you're going to have 
Um, no exposure, no exposure, no exposure. Starting to get some exposure, some exposure, some exposure. Now you, now you hit the maximum. Uh, and the point here is that as far as the Z is concerned, you'll notice where the bottom of the pen is. It is below the center. However, when we're measuring the Y, distance there, we're, we're just interested in that distance, that Y, even though the position is there. I don't know. Do, do, I think do, we do, see do, that. Do it's, it? it, yeah, I think we can see that. I think it's well improvised as well, <laughs> Peter, considering you didn't know, happened to have a CD and a pen there. That was great. I think uh, that was great. Thank you. Um, now, uh, Noel GHGZ says, in the unlikely occasion of a field visit from Ofcom, what calculations and rules set will they use? That is the million dollar question. And what they have said is that as long as you have got a way of demonstrating compliance, that will be OK. And what they have also said is that um, if you have got pre-assessed um, configurations from the RSGB, um, then that will be OK. So essentially what we are trying to do is to put sufficient information and some people might say it looks rather complicated, but this is why we're doing it. Sufficient information in the pre-assessed con um, configuration documentation so that when Ofcom come along and you, and you start waving at them, um, they will say, OK, fine. The other aspect is we are communicating these with Ofcom. And finally, um, I have actually been invited to go to Baldock and, and we'll be taking that up, and so that we are going to have engagement with Ofcom. So I think essentially we're we're working behind the scenes to get Ofcom inverted commas to accept what is done here, or at least not to challenge it. I think though the the, the key thing to um, to really realise is that Ofcom are probably not equipped to come along to. XT thousand radiometers, all of a sudden starts um, start pouring through your proofs. They're only likely to come along if they have got reason to do a check. And the best way of avoiding having a reason to do a check is always be sensible, always be wise to what you're doing, and don't give reason for people to uh, moan to Ofcom about you. If you can do that, then I think you should be all right. This is this really is a marathon. It is. And the fact that they're saying needs to be done by the middle of November, Ofcom are not going to be ready to do any investigations for a while. Um, and even if they do, there will be an opportunity to um, to discuss things with them rather than getting into real trouble. So don't don't worry, I think, is the main thing. Yes, thanks very much, Peter. Um, I think that there's a really obviously good um, advice to give everybody um, but I guess what well, the real message at least the ones that we've had in my club is that don't ignore this because it is becoming real and need to at least start considering it. Um, Demonstrate responsibility um, and but don't panic about it. Right now I've got an interesting twist of a, a question for you now over on Zoom from Benno uh, PA3 FBX tried an experiment boiling an egg with a two meter dish and a hundred watt DATV up on the QO 100 put an egg onto a long rod in front of the dish, but no heating experienced after up to 15 minutes. Why? And I guess he's also still hungry. But anyway, <laughs> have you got a, a suggestion on as to why? Well, it, quite simply, um, I, 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 would, I would just put the question another way. How many people would buy a 100 watt outdoor barbecue um, a microwave oven? Um, I mean, if you need to have um, you know, a 600, 700, 800 watts confined in a very small cube um, and very well contained in a microwave oven in order to give you suitable heating. If you turn the power down um, to very low levels, it doesn't work very well. And if you've got something that is intended to distribute energy rather than focus it, it's not surprising that you will not be able to uh, get energy absorbed in a very small volume. So that's that's basically the answer. And and I know that in my previous life we had uh, you had all, all the uh, internet uh, problems of having uh, twelve mobile phones um, switched on and put round an, an egg. And all I can say is that you'd have to wait a very 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 long time before the egg rotted, and that would be it. 
you'll go hungry as well. So, okay. all right, thanks for that advice there. Um, Mike G zero L J F um, just says my advice: keep your parabola up high and upstairs in effect because it solves a lot of things in one. That's his advice. Um, and that, that, that if, if you've got the ability to, to operate with your antennas high and not pointing towards ground and not pointing towards any any building, clearly that is good. Um, but obviously, we, we you'll have to recognise that uh, people like to go out um, portable with tripods at waist height, etc. Um, and obviously, we need to work out how to manage those. But on um, that subject, though, yeah. Peter, so if we went out portable, if we were either on our own or we were only with other radio amateurs, wouldn't we be excluded anyway because we're not considered general public? I think what you've got to be able to say is that uh, as long as you are able to control the zone and make sure that there's nobody in the zone the, where they might get ex might exceed the compliance limit, um, then you're going to be absolutely fine. But again, do you really want to have anybody walking through your beam if you're trying to work the DX? I mean, do you, do you tend to ask them politely to get out of the way. Yeah, yeah, for more than one reason now, though, as well. For safety as well as um, for your community for your QSO. Um, Noel asks in the exclusion maps, what did power stroke watts mean? Um, power in the feed ERP question mark is that one for Ian maybe? Um, yeah, it's it's powered. Well, it was for, for Peter actually consistent with um, with all our other work on the on the lower bands. It's it's power. Mm -hmm actually radiated from the from the antenna yeah I, I think, from the feed horn initially yeah. right i think what we're what we've got to also um express here is that these um compliance maps are simp are, are simplified they might, might look complicated but they're simplified we're not trying to demonstrate non-compliance we are trying to give a simple as possible way of saying something is going to be compliant. So therefore it is a sufficient condition to be compliant, but you may well be able to do far better analyses or far better measurements in order to demonstrate that even closer in, you may still be compliant. Um, so therefore we are kind of drawing a line around the outside of an area and only, only certain locations within that might actually be non-compliant. And again, that's going to depend specifically on your operation. And again, in order to be non-compliant, you might have to have somebody standing there while you're operating key down, while you're doing that for um, several minutes at a time. And all of these conditions are necessary for somebody actually physically to be overexposed. So therefore, what we're doing here is really being conservative but at the same time hopefully being realistically conservative so that it doesn't necessarily stop you from doing what you really want to be able to do which is easily set up your equipment operate and hopefully work um, you know work away and uh, set up new dx records thank you uh, oh, sorry ian do you want to come back on that um it it does refer to something that that was mentioned in the slide about uh, if you in the in the talk if if you do find somebody wanders into the the exclusion zone then it's okay if you if you switch off reasonably promptly because of the the essentially because of the time it takes to heat up body tissue, uh, which is reflected in the, the six minute averaging rule. Um, I think it's very important to, to realize that because um, this is not a situation where non-compliance uh, results in, in sudden death. It's not, um, it's not a situation like somebody was um, as, as if somebody was operating an amateur uh, 33 kV switch yard in their own back garden where uh, where any non-compliance would be terminal it, it's it's not like that it's a gradual process and that's why it's important not to not to overreact uh, if uh, if something goes slightly astray 
Okay, Ian, thank you. Uh, from Paul G6 MJ, N, N, M, sorry, MNJ, I think we can all visualize the shape of the radiation from a dish and where the calculations state where the EZ ends. For us who transmit up to QO100, the dish is tilted back at 30 degrees and the EZ must be closer to the dish if I understand what is being said as the cone of RF is now the point up. This is um, partly true. I don't, I don't think the, um, the distance um, will actually change. Your, your, your axis will as, as, as you tilt it up. Um, so I mean, that's something that we're going to work on in terms of how we can present it. But essentially, you've got something that is um, so wide and so high. Um, and as long as that um, misses any, anyone or anywhere where people might be, um, then you're going to be OK. OK, Ian, anything on that? Um, other than other than saying um, if you uh, if you sh if you if you can imagine uh, a dish uh, with with the dual band feed, if you if you set the dish up to be um, to be unobstructed uh, on the receive side, you're going to be pretty close to being uh, compliant on the transmit side as well. The beam width may be ra rather narrower on, on the receive side, but uh, basically just follow the same kinds of rules that common sense rules that, that you would uh, ideally put the thing on the wall or something and tilt it up and and some combination of that will um, will see you right uh, if that won't work i know of one person who's who's got the dish low down in the back garden but he can also be sure that nobody will um, will stray into that area or at least if they do uh, that that nobody is going to remain in that area so um there's there's not going to be anything particularly new here. And uh, I think most people will discover that what they've already done is going to turn out compliant without needing to do anything else, which is kind of the whole point of the exercise as far as we're concerned. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd just like to come back on that. One of the things that um, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to demonstrate is if you've got a Z compliance um, value what, what that will mean is that if you if you draw a line um, along the axis that you are transmitting and there is nothing or nowhere um, within the Z compliance distance that it intersects at whatever angle you go up or down, then the chances are you're going to be OK. I think that's likely to be the, the, the sort of interpretation that um, we'll be able to make. And so therefore, um, if you happen to be, um, I don't know, 30, 30 metres away um, and, it's, and the 2.4 metres is the Z clearance, then if you happen to want to miss the top of a house, then you kind of do the uh, Pythagoras and you work out whether your, your, your angle results in um, a clearance of 2.4 metres or more from the top of the house or wherever you want to be. And therefore, that, that will be the basis upon which you can work out any clearance angles. OK, Peter, thank you. From Mike G4GUG, so he says, so prime focus ground mounted dishes are a no-no at workable input power levels? Uh, they are, they're not a no-no. Uh, it just means that um, you've got to be careful wh where you point them, under what conditions. If you have got them ground mounted and you're, I mean, if you're, trying to radiate uh, over a long distance um, and you're transmitting parallel to a large flat piece of ground, the chances are that you're going to have some difficulty in communi communicating anyway uh, for all sorts of reasons. You'll tend to want to go into ground mounted where you've got um, slopes. But for example, if you happen to be on top of a pimple or on top of a mountain and under those circumstances, the ground will be sloping well away from you. And that's it. Uh, that is very similar um, to the situation of having an up-tilted um, beam uh, flat on the ground. So ground mounted is not necessarily a problem. It's just something that needs to be managed. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, oh, yeah could I just point of out course, one Ian. thing yeah. uh, where it, these things, as Peter says, that they need to be managed. But um, 
I think each of us has got to realize that uh, we are each the world expert on what goes on in our own back garden and the practicalities of that. And so as long as nobody is in front of the dish, when you are transmitting, that's, that is all that this is about. If nobody is in front of the dish, when you are transmitting uh, in a way that puts them inside the, the exclusion zone, then you're absolutely fine. Take away either of those things, the transmission or the presence of a person, and you're, and you're fine. Thanks. Yeah, I, I just come back to actually a talk which you've given to my club, Ian, and also one from John Rogers, which I did hosted for the RSGB. Uh, it was one of the interesting things is that they define the public by, in this case, your family as well, don't they? So it does it does cover your family members too. They they do in they do indeed. Uh, you you have that you have that responsibility. The the Ofcom's rationale is that um, radio amateurs are supposed to understand the the risks that that they're running. Um, however, that's uh, that's not an unlimited um, permission to, uh, to to expose yourself or your or your fellow radio amateurs to high levels of RF. And uh, I have a feeling in the end, we're going to, RSGB is going to recommend um, using using exposure limits for workers, uh, for for amateurs to, to cover that rather than Ofcom just not saying anything at all. We, we fell through a crack there, quite frankly. Actually, I'm going to skip then to, as you mentioned that, a question from uh, Dave that came in a little while ago, which basically I'm trying, I'm trying to look over quite a lot of questions. You, as you, I'm sure you'll you'll realise. Um, and and he said, is there any experience of what Ofcom have asked for from commercial operators linked to what you just said about workers? There is all sorts of experience in this. Um, um, as Ian said in the uh, invite, um, I was involved in. Um, defining the Vodafone Group Health and Safety um, Policy, or at least the, uh, the, you know, the technical aspects. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, uh, yes, there's, 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 you know, there's a whole load of stuff. But there's the, the key thing that's different between radio amateur operation and uh, base station or broadcast um, is that those those locations are not going to be manned. They are going to be um, left alone. And so therefore the management of is somebody there is slightly more, slightly difficult. I mean, you've got to make sure that you've got locked doors um, or that you locate the antenna sufficiently high so it's unconditionally compliant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, those restrictions are not necessarily there for the radio amateurs. So yes, it is different for the operators. Um, and uh, a hell of a lot has been learned. Okay, thanks. Uh, Graham Sherville is back in from his electric car experience of watching the convention back in the shack now, he says. And he says, thanks for another great presentation. Will we eventually have a nice, simple spreadsheet to use for different dish sizes, frequencies, power levels, etc.? We are anticipating that, yes. Uh, in, in fact, I think um, a, a little bit of that was, was shown. And... This work, you know, all, all of the, you know, you know, the algorithms to produce this um, has actually been done over the last four weeks. Um, okay, I, I did um, quite a bit of um, work on dishes about 18 months ago, but essentially turning that into uh, what was in this presentation has basically taken me four weeks. Um, what we now need to do, though, is to talk with uh, David and Noel um, and go through um, a little bit of a drain drop review, what's been going on, and then say, okay, I, I, I can do, create kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes of data. But what we really want to do is exactly as the questioner was saying, is turn that um, data into information. And exactly how we do that and how we present that is something that, that exactly we, uh, you know, that, that Ian and I uh, would really love to talk with David and uh, Noel about uh, um, offline uh, as we move towards finalising uh, the PAEC3. I'm sure. Well, that, that, that's a 
makes a lot of sense and hopefully also people will help contribute as Ian said earlier on in his presentation and help with some of the feedback and information on their experience with this as well. Uh, John G8PEF says, on a practical note, in situations where we are demonstrating radio at a public event, for example, any good suggestions for how to mark out and physically exclude people from the EZ? I would say be sensible. Um, what you don't want to have is uh, something which, um, you know, which frightens everybody um, because that's just going to raise concern uh, and, and, and all sorts of things. Uh, I would say that in most places, you've got to work out where the EZ is. Um, if possible, in a public event, make the EZ basically un inaccessible. Um, now, obviously, if you're demonstrating a microwave dish on a tripod at 10 gigahertz or above, for example, that isn't going to be possible. But the question is, do you actually need to be transmitting at 400 watts? in that situation. I mean, what, what exactly are you going to be demonstrating? Well, no, you don't need to do that. You, can, you might want to set up a short link, but if you're doing a short link, you can run at 10 milliwatts or 100 milliwatts and you'll be compliant. And if you're compliant, you don't have a zone. So just, just go through the thought processes uh, along those lines and you can have a perfectly good demonstration without necessarily having things marked out. Okay, thank you. Brian G4EWJ says, does the exclusion zone extend through windows or fences? Uh, he's thinking particularly of a QO100 dish at ground level. I'd say it, it, it's kind of difficult to start modeling um, with obstructions and things like that. So I would say more, more or less, yes, there's going to be attenuation um, by such items but how you, how you would actually work out what that attenuation is, how big that attenuation is, whether it um, reduces the size of the zone or anything like that. Um, that is something that is rather difficult to try and work out. Hang on a second, we've got a cup of tea arriving. Yeah. Thanks, well, son. All right. Um, so my, my, my advice would really be, uh, as far as interpreting these zones, um, whether or not you've got obstacles or anything in the way, just treat it as it's free space and, and draw the lines through there. And also have another thought. If you, you know, these EZs are likely to be in places where you would like to have a clear line of sight or take off anyway. And if you happen to be beaming through windows, beaming through um, um, uh, you know, great big lumps of metal on fences, Perhaps you need to find a different location anyway. Yes, good point. Um, by the way, just to let you know at home, if you were expecting probably a little break at three and then we we're going on, we're, we're just going to have a break a little bit later and take all these questions because it's a unique opportunity to get answers to all these, but we'll still be having everything else that we planned with Noel and his talk later on. So I hope you guys are all right to stay there. You've got a cup of tea, Peter. You can do another couple of hours, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> all right, not a couple of hours. Um, so on the very similar subject actually from John G3XDY how much loss should be assumed for double skin brick walls as this will reduce exclusion si zone size you're, yeah, you're quite right and um, I think if you look in PAEC2 um, you will find a, a sort of comment that says uh, if you think you can actually come up with a way of computing stuff then you're on your own um, and it does have a couple of references, including um, a report that was done uh, on behalf of Ofcom as the reference. Um, I don't want to take responsibility for that because uh, attenuation is going to depend on materials, whether it's wet or dry, whether it's thick, whether it's thin, whether the frequency, the angle of incidence, etc. You start naming a variable and the chances are it's going to affect the attenuation. Um, and what we're trying to do here is to have more generic rules and guidelines that are conservative. And as I said earlier on, if you have got further ways of uh, demonstrating compliance, then by all means, you can try and use them, but you're on your own. But I, again, I will come back to a very simple um, um, expression. And that is, if you're beaming into uh, brick walls and things like that, 
the chances are that you aren't doing you're not doing something right if you're trying to communicate over a long distance yes thanks uh just a quick question, a comment rather that's come back in from John GAPEF. He said, thank you. He was the gentleman who asked about public events and advice for that. And he said, I was specifically thinking about QO100 demos as part of an event in a local park. Since we can only mount a dish at ground level and we need a certain minimum power level to access the satellite, I think the fence pins and orange fencing might have to put in an appearance. So it's just possibly. really... Possibly. Yeah, possibly. Um... But I mean, what you might, yeah, you might be able to do some other things, but that that, that would be um, a way of doing it. But um, I don't know, I mean, how, how long is the QO100? Are we talking about the um, 10 meters or something like that? Um, I, I so don't know I, this. I, 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 think, I, think that, that, I think that was the sort of um, distance for 20 watts and uh, um, uh, 1.2 meter uh, dish. It so was. Um, it, it, it shouldn't be too difficult down beam. And Essentially, you wouldn't want to have people walking into that uh, area uh, because it's, it's going to um, affect the communication. Hmm. But again, what I don't, the other thing that we haven't got here, of course, is you know, what is the op tilt in that situation? Um, so again, what you might find is that by the time you have taken into consideration that you're not beaming actually parallel to the ground, but you actually have got a few degrees of op tilt, that is likely to, in, in effect, reduce how far out you need to be in order to make sure that the beam is um, an appropriate clearance from the ground. And, and also, Peter, I just thought that if, if there was a vehicle or something there, like a van or something like that, where they could safely mount a dish on a roof, that's going to take it out of probably nearly all of the line of it where anybody could walk in front of the beam. Well, well yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that, that, that comes down to getting the antenna off the ground, yes. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, the, the premise was that you need to have it on the ground or, or at um, waist height or something. So, yes. OK. Um, it's right. Uh, this is from Mark, uh, G0NMY. Where I'm confused, he said, is if I have a dish up on the chimney or, an or antennas of my terraced house. Is ground the actual ground, 33 feet plus, or is it the, in the ground of the upstairs floor? I think it's the latter. But we'd just like to check. Sorry if this is a silly question. No, it's an, it is an excellent question. The um, we're, we're not uh, we're not talking here necessarily about ground. We're talking about an exclusion zone, which is the position of where people can walk. So therefore, in this case, if people are going to uh, walk on the roof of a building, if if that happens to be a um, a, a general access area then that will be the height that we, you'd have to consider in your exclusion zone. Uh, if they're talking about an upper floor level, then that will be the floor level that you'd have to consider in your exclusion zone. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's not a silly question. It's, it is a very pertinent question. And it's really, we're defining where is the exclusion zone where anybody can actually walk. Yes, thanks, uh, Peter. Um... I just thought a mention here is well something's come to my mind that I don't think any of us have mentioned. Um, I'm sure many of you watching, we know um, this is the British Amateur Television Club, um, but many of you are watching mem members from different countries. And what we should stress is that these are the regulations for the UK uh, from Ofcom, which is our regulatory um, authority. And it, that may vary slightly, even though ICNERP is an international regulation, but that may vary slightly in your own country. And someone has actually asked that, that very question a moment ago. Chris F1 FAQ says, are the EZ calculation the same as in other countries? So I think, would you agree that you need to check the, the exact reg regulations in your own country on your licensing authority? Absolutely. Um, you'll find that the um, regulations are, are going to be based on ICNERP in most countries but there can be some, um, you know, some strange variations in, in, in certain countries. Um, this, by the way, has been all based upon the new ICNERP 2020 regulations. Um, now, the advantage of the 2020 is that it's got some whole body average and also peak values defined separately in a way that we can actually utilize. Um, the present European regulations are based upon ICNERP 1998 and it depends on what regulators are allowing. Um, as a result of our communication with Ofcom during the consultation period, 
and we have got the ability to use either ICNRP 2020 or ICNRP 1998. Um, as long as we're clear about which set of um, guidance we're using in the UK, we are free to do that. And that's one of the things that we won through uh, a certain amount of um, um, assertive communication with Ofcom during consultation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael EA7 KIR, we saw his project a little while ago. He said, why not use, why not just use a field strength meter? A field strength meter, one, will give you a power density or something at a certain location. Um, but with what uncertainty, how are you going to deal with it? Um, are you going to, uh, does it have the right capture area in order to be able to do the right sampling if you're going to do spatial averaging, etc.? So if you have got an appropriate um, power density meter that is appropriately calibrated and you can do the appropriate spatial averaging or peak identification and you feel that you can then convince the, um, the regulator that that's fine, then you can do that. Um, but all, all I can say is that it's probably easier to do a computation um, than it is necessarily to start wandering around in space trying to interpret values. I mean, Ian, what do you think on that? Yeah, uh, I, I agree that, uh, well, if, if you wanted to do measurements in the UK, then you would fall under the jurisdiction of, uh, of standards such as IEC 62232. Um, and when you start to open up those documents, it's really scary. Every, everything that was said about computed points uh, in, in this presentation, if you were going the measurement route, Ofcom would require you to, uh, to be following these standards and um, it's not as easy as it looks. Where there is a place, I think, for, uh, for measurement is as check measurements, such that um, if, uh, if you're saying, I don't, expect, um, I don't expect high values, uh, the other side of this fence or something, something like that, you're, you're in a position to, to check that in, in general terms. Um, and that would that would help build your case with with Ofcom uh, should you should you ever need to do so. Uh, but I did mention earlier that um, that UK microwave operators mostly are a halfway at least to being able to do check measurements because um, with decades of, uh, of microwave round tables, most people have had their um, had their homemade instruments or, um, or or old surplus instruments uh, checked against equipment that is in calibration uh, that's been uh, liberated from a lab for the weekend kind of thing. Uh, the other side of that is what kind of antenna to use, and there there are two completely separate routes. One is the uh, is the tiny, tiny three axis antenna, which tries its best to be isotropic. Um, and those will cost you a fortune. The other, which is, uh, I don't think complies with any standards is to use something like a, a calibrated gain horn, which is, uh, which I know numbers of microwave group people have and um, and numbers of people have built these things so if you if you connect those two together then it's it's only a little bit of uh, arithmetic to to convert uh, milliwatts uh, in the power meter to watts per square meter uh, entering the horn uh, so it's that's semi calibrated and at least you can be fairly confident that the decimal point is in the right place, and this can add a lot of uh, a lot of confidence to to the calculations because um, there is this effect with uh, with a very short wavelengths that you're either in the exclusion zone or or you're out of it. Uh, the boundaries are really quite sharp, so there's there's some value 
there. Um, I think we're feeling a lot less positive about people wanting to do um, wanting to do measurements only on uh, on HF or the lower bands because they don't have any idea of the difficulties involved. I think one of the things that um, uh, people don't realise is some of the complexity that has been gone into. I think earlier on we had a question whether things have been learned from um, the commercial experience. Um, my, my experience is that it, it, it gets very, very complicated and that is reflected within the complexity of the standards. And I will mention that, I mean, one standard that is commonly mentioned here is the IEC 62232, which is um, being developed. And I think it's, you know, the next edition is going to be coming out in uh, um, 20, uh, well, next year sometime, which will be the third edition. And that's going to be somewhere around about um, between two and 300 pages of uh, uh, finely argued um, engineering information. Um, and it's going to cost you two or 300 um, euros in order to get it. Um, another document which you might find of interest is from the IEEE, um, and I'll plug that one, that it's uh, C95.3, and um, I, I will send um, David a, a link a little bit later um, on where you can actually get hold of that free of charge, and that's just a general advisory document. Um, I, I plug that because, uh, again, I was the chair of the group that actually created that, and that was published in 2021. And that, as I say, that's free of charge. They're not easy reads, but if you really do want to start getting an idea of um, how things are done professionally and what you need to think of, um, they are they're very useful. And my suggestion is invest in nothing and get the IEEE document or invest two or 300 um, euros and get the uh, um, the IEC document. It's your choice. <laughs> Quite an easy choice, I think. Thank you. Uh, G3LTF says, which of the many formula did you use for the near field limit and in a great presentation, he says. Um, I don't really want to go into the mathematics here. The, um, essentially, there's a, um, a 4P over AE where AE is the um, um, equivalent area, taking, in, in, taking into consideration the um, illumination um, efficiency. Um, however, that's something that we'll be coming into um, further. And I know that you are somewhat of an expert in this area. So um, yeah, maybe we can talk offline. All right, thank you. Um, I've got a, I've got a, as, as uh... Uh, Mike said, just lighten the mood a little bit because he's put in a couple of a couple of times now. So I need to read this and say that look out for the cost of two point seven meter tripods escalating. He says, <laughs> <laughs> and presumably getting into short supply as well. Thanks, Mike. You got your, you got your message read. Um, link to what we just said from uh, G three LTF from Keith GU six EFB. Is the output Ofcom stroke RSGB calculator data still reliable and accepted based on the information in today's presentation? I would say that um, the answer is yes. Um, bear in mind that uh, what we're talking about here is what is sufficient for compliance and what is necessary for compliance. So the outcome of the Ofcom um, calculator might come up with a distance of 15 or 16 metres or something like that. And indeed, if you're 15 or 16 metres away, then fine, you know, if, if that's okay, 15 or 16 metres up, 16 metres out, if, if that doesn't cause you a problem, then it doesn't cause you a problem, you, you know, that's fine. Um, however, I think we can very easily demonstrate that, um, you know, it's a bit challenging for you guys to have dishes 15 or 16 metres up and steer them and et cetera, et cetera. And therefore you need to have an alternative and that's really what we're trying to create here is something that is less restrictive than would be given by um, the Ofcom type calculator. Um, it's still going to be perhaps more restrictive than possibly could be proven by very specific um, computations and or measurements if done appropriately. But, uh, but as, a, as a compromise between something that is hopelessly conservative and something that is uh, uh, is actually useful. I'm hoping that we're getting at least somewhere in, in the balance right. Um, as I say, and that's why I'm really looking to, forward to working with David and Noel 
um, at least initially, to uh, to make sure that we actually achieve that. And uh, they're going to be our sanity checkers. Sure. One final question we've got time for now, and this comes from Mike G0LGF. It says, I've measured dVBS2 average power, and it indicates broadly similar within 2 or 3 dB on a thermal power meter and a diode-based meter, so not too insignificant, or not too significant, sorry. Is that a question? Um, I guess it's a point, really, um, but they're just saying they've used a measure. Um, I think earlier on, did we have another comment on there? No, I think that's all I've got. So I'm just reading that. And in fact, that was re relayed by Dave, possibly someone who's um, looked at the Q0100 feed and putting messages on there, I think, possibly. Okay. I, I, mean, I mean, certainly, I mean, if, if you've got something that works on a, a thermal power detector, it's going to be presumably calibrated for um, watts per square meter. Um, so, yes, I mean, there's going to be a whole range of detectors out there that potentially can be used as long as you know what they're doing how, and how they're working and how they relate to A, to the field and B, when you actually interpret it, what that actually means in terms of an exposure assessment. And I think, you know, the final comment here that perhaps we can give is that just knowing the, the design of your equipment isn't enough. Knowing the design of equipment and the power density that you've got everywhere isn't enough. What you need to do is to go through the whole process of working out what that means in terms of a potential exposure to a person and where that might need to be applied. And then what do you do about it? And, and so therefore this is an exposure assessment challenge as opposed to a power density challenge. And, there's, and, and there are subtle differences. I think that does sound a really appropriate place to end, actually, because that's what we all need to do now, start thinking about that. Also, that our information and the calculator is on the RSGB website. It's rsgb.org forward slash EMF. I think they can find lots of information there as well. Ian, Peter, thank you ever so much, not only for the time that you've given us today, but all of the time that you must be putting, along with John Rogers and, and others in the team, to putting all this into terms which are relevant to amateurs and terms that we can all understand because we're not all experts in RF and, and that sort of thing. Um, and you're doing it really for the good of the hobby and, and just to put another pin on your, on your behalf as well that you, you, know, you do encourage people to write to you with information and advice and, and um, experience that they've had, especially if they can help you with the calculators and things. But Ian and Peter, thank you very much indeed for the time today and all of that work that you're putting into this.